I uh, just wanted to mention a couple things. We're going to be taking questions after the panelists make their. I am using my mic. Okay. All right. Is that better? All right. Okay. So after the panelists make the open inter opening introduction, we are going to be taking questions from the audience, but uh, folks are going to have to fill out cards. We have two folks uh, collecting cards. Raise your hands. I think it's Joanne, right? Joanne, okay, I got to mix up. Taking cards, and we'll um, go to questions right away. We're not going to waste a lot of time. Uh, we want to hear from you guys. So we have, have a good discussion here amongst the panelists and answer your questions. So before we get going, before I make an introductory comment, I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, speaking first is going to be Carol Simpson. And many, uh, I think we all know who Carol Simpson is. She's a you know, legendary journalist. Has been, had, she was the first black woman television reporter in the city of Chicago and is the first woman of color to have anchored duties on a major network. Throughout her career, Simpson has remi remained committed to reporting on social issues such as racism, violence against women and children, and teenage pregnancy. Uh, Simpson has reported and walked alongside Martin Luther King Jr. as he marched, helped anchor ABC's news, news live coverage of major national international events, such as the release of Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Her dedication to fight racism and sexism, sexism have garnered her many awards and respect of her colleagues. In 1998, she founded the Carol Simpson Leadership Institute at, Af at the African Women's Media Center in Dakar, Sen Senegal, for African American journalists. Uh, she's also right now a leader in residence at Emerson College, Department of Journalism, and she's the author of the book uh, News Lady, right? Is that correct? And um, after, after Carol, Juan Gonzalez is, a, uh, as everyone knows, co host of Democracy Now! He's been a professional journalist for, the, for more than 30 years and a staff columnist at the New York Daily News. Gonzalez is the founder and past president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and co-founder of Unity Journals of Color. Gonzalez is the award-winning journalist. Just, just, just past week, he's won, he was honored for winning his second Polk Award. Gonzalez has written three books, Fallout, The Environmental Consequences of the World Trade Center, Harvest of Empire, History of Latinos in America, and Roll Down the Windows, Stories of Forgotten America. And we are complete, uh, Juan and I are completely uh, in the process of finishing our book, which is the, actually the title of this uh, session. Uh, next is going to be Loris Taylor. Loris Taylor is the president of the Native uh, Public Media, which represents the media interests of Native American, Native American and news media technologies, including radio, television, video, and the internet, journalism, and pu public policy. She was instrumental in helping to establish the first FCC tribal priority for broadcasting and the new FCC Office of Native American po Policy. Taylor led the team that published the seminal study, New America, Technology, new, uh, new Media Technology and Internet Use in Indian Country, and contributed to FCC's National Broadband Plan. She was a former general manager of KUI FM Radio and co-founded Unity Jones of Color Indian Country News Bureau. And our last speaker is going to be Rin Ku Sin, who is the president and executive director of the Applied Research Center and publisher of Color Lines Magazine. She's a leading figure in racial justice movement for the last 20 years. Rin Ku has positioned ARC as the national home for media research and activism. Uh, over the course of her career, Riku has woven together journalism and organizing to further social change. Riku started her organizing career as a student activist at Brown University fighting race, gender, and class discrimination on campus. She received a BA in women's studies at, from Brown in 1988 and a master's in journalism from Columbia University in 2005. So we have a great panel. You know, Often, when, whenever I speak on a panel like this, or I'm on a panelist or a moderator, I like to begin by quoting the inaugural issue of Freedom's Journal, our nation's first American newspaper founded in 1827. In that issue, the paper's publishers told its readers why they created the publication. They simply stated, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken from us, for, for us. From the press to the pulpit, we have suffered much by being incorrectly represented. It is an amazing statement and tragic that this statement is still as relevant today as it was when it was first published nearly two centuries ago. It is a powerful reminder that our nation's news media is often the primary author of a deeply flawed racial narrative, a narrative that marginalizes us portraying communities of, colors, communities of color as threats to society. It is a destructive narrative that the news media continues to advance to this very day, 
Just ask any Latino about the harm caused to their community by programs like Lou Dobbs. Or ask any Muslim about the harm caused by the coverage of the, culture, of the Islamic Cultural Center in Lower Manhattan. But the quote from Freedom's Journal is also an important reminder that people of color have been challenging and fighting to have a voice in our nation's media system for nearly 200 years. Quite simply, this is, there's nothing new about this struggle. The name of this panel today, as I just mentioned, is actually the name of the book that Juan and I have co-authored that will be coming out later this year. In the book, we attempt to understand why and how laws passed by government have systematically excluded people of color from fully participating in our nation's uh, media system and the harmful coverage that has resulted when we are unable to tell our own stories. We have a great panel today, as I just mentioned, and, and during the panel, we're gonna talk about the lessons we have learned from our past struggles and the challenges we face today in being able to tell our own stories in our own words. Because as we gather here in Boston in 2011, our nation is being transformed by a demographic, sh demographic shift that will result in people of color making up the majority of the US population within the next few decades. Our nation has also experienced a technological shift that is transforming the media industry, changing the way people receive their news. Traditional media like newspapers are struggling to stay afloat. The presence of journalists of color working in our nation's newsrooms is in decline. So is minority ownership of broadcast stations. And with the exceptions of, of sites like Color Lines, few journalists of color are being hired by emerging online news operations. And as, you, as you've been hearing all weekend, the future of the internet is in danger, which would uh, you know, keep our nation's news if, the, if we lose the internet, if the internet is no longer an open system, that deeply flaw, flawed racial narrative will guarantee to continue because we will be unable to control our own image. So with that, I want to start the panel discussion. Again, we can, uh, raise your hand if you want to start uh, as you hear the panel speak and you want to ask questions. Uh, fill out the cards and I will, look, I will go through them. But we're going to begin by asking each panelist to answer this very simple question, talk a little about, the, uh, about their, their life story as well. Uh, throughout our history, people of color have fought for a fair and just media system. What can we learn from those previous struggles and what is the fight today for a fair and just media system? So with that, the first person I'm going to uh, bring up is Carol Simpson, who has a, a great story. I haven't read your book, Carol, but I've read, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't said, read your book yet, but I, I've read Howard Kurtz's uh, Daily Beast article when it first came out. And, you know, someone of Miss Simpson's stature, it's just amazing what she had to go through in the newsroom. Uh, you know, leading African-American journalist, one of the leading African-American journalists ever in the history of the newsroom in broadcast journalism, but yet all the racism and sexism she still had to encounter. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's just unbelievable. So um, with that, we'll bring up Ms. Simpson. Why didn't you read my book? Uh, and why, all, why weren't you all there? Yeah, you know, she, she was book signing. book signing. I sold no book. Nobody came. Amazon, folks, come on. <laughs> Amazon, just order it. Say that again? Yeah, it's not, if, uh, we'll put it in there. If folks can't hear it, we're going to hold it. Voice. I have a very loud voice. Uh, can all of you hear me? Um, I heard like an iPod going that had music, like somebody had <laughs> taken their earphones off and left it going, but I don't hear it now. Was that what it was? Well, it was very annoying. I'm glad it has stopped. Um, where do I begin? Hmm. The epic story of race as regards the media. 40 years in radio and television, starting in the turbulent 60s. During all those years, I have seen progress and I have seen erosion of progress. Today, we are in a period of erosion for minorities on the air and off the air. I used to think that there would be a steady angle of progression. The graph line would just keep going up and we'd keep doing better and better and get more positions. The line graph has been a roller coaster. And we are now in a down swoop 
of the roller coaster. A lot of it can be attributed to the contraction of news. News television networks at ABC, they laid off half the news division that I worked for. Um, we're seeing newspapers closing and contracting and desperately trying to find a way to keep going. Um, newspaper readership is in sharp decline and more and more effort is being put by the newspapers into their web product. That means the media is not concerned, not concerned at all these days with diversity or hiring more people of color. They are fighting for survival. And you can understand that. It would be nice if these editors and news directors would be altruistic and still keep their media businesses afloat, but it's not happening. Self-preservation is the watchword of the day, so there are fewer jobs for all, and minorities feel the impact the hardest. But let me go back to how long ago African Americans have been fighting in the media for equality. Former slave Frederick Douglass, my all-time favorite journalist, a man who was born to a slave woman. His father was a white man that he never knew. His mother died when he was seven. He was sold to a ship captain in Baltimore. And he taught himself to read and write. And he came out a former slave with the first African-American newspaper, the North Star, in 1845 in Rochester, New York. He used its pages to argue, not only for the abolition of slavery, but for racial equality. 1845, former slave, trying to make the case. He would become one of the foremost proponents and most popular speakers for the end of slavery. President Lincoln sought his counsel were he alive today, Douglas would no doubt have something to say about the media's complicity in denigrating and perpetuating negative stereotypes about minority groups. I just went to the panel about uh, race and gender representations on television, and they were talking about the reality shows and compared The Bachelor, who has a white bachelor, and he has white women, for the most part, who want to marry him more than anything else in the world. And then they pointed out flavor, the flavor of love <laughs> with Flavor Flav, uh, a minstrel with women who are just feed into perpetuating negative stereotypes of, of, of black people. I, it, it just makes me crazy that we are complicit in our own demise, as it were, in terms of respect from the rest of America. Um, as one of the at one of the national networks for which I worked, we had a tape library, and if anyone was doing a story on, say, housing construction, uh, you could go to the tape library and get B-roll, or cover footage, that we call it, um, and you can get scenes of foundations being laid and houses being framed and carpenters nailing and plumbers laying pipe. And, if you, and you could use that video to help make your story more interesting and it related to what you were talking about. And if you were working on consumer spending, there was a consumer spending reel. And it had money being printed and the exchange of dollars with a cash register. A, what do you call the people that run a cash register? A checkout person, <laughs> the clerk, whatever. Um, you would see shoppers in malls. You'd see people carrying packages and grocery bags to their cars. And you'd see products on shelves and, and clothing racks. 
And you could use this video to make a better television story with the pictures that you were talking about. Guess what we had to my horrors? It was the black clip reel. A lot of us had not seen it because we had gathered our own video of black people for the stories that we were telling, but a lot of white producers that had to run in and get a story on the air about something to do with black people would go to the black clip reel. You know what was on it? Black men hanging outside liquor stores, black pregnant teenagers, gang members face down on the ground as they're being arrested by white police, welfare lines, ramshackle houses, hungry children in the South, black boys with boom boxes blaring rap music. You get the picture. That was the black clip reel. There were no video of black teachers, black doctors, black scientists, black middle-class neighborhoods, black men and women dressed up and working at well-paying corporate jobs, black people going to church or working as community activists in disadvantaged communities. Producers and library personnel put together those clip reels. When we black correspondents found out about it, we went to top management and explained to them the subtle racism that that was. That's what white people thought they needed to tell a story about black people. All negative, everything negative. Um, and that racism was entrenched in the news division. It manifested itself in the clip reel, but it also manifested itself in people not being promoted, not being advanced, not getting the same salaries. When I was at ABC News as a national correspondent, I covered a lot of social issues, and when I was doing a story on poverty, I went out of my way to find white people that were poor. Hungry white people, I would hunt them down in Kentucky in Texas, Oxnard, California, I went everywhere because constantly, every time you saw poor people, only blacks were represented. And yet the biggest number of poor people in America are white people. The largest number of them receiving food stamps are white people. The largest number of them on welfare are white people. But you would not know that. You would not believe that if you looked at television news. I was also doing a story on crack mothers. I reached high and wide and long and far to find a white crack mother. Sure, I'm going to put black crack mothers in there, but I was going to find me a white crack mother to put in that piece. Uh, because what happens is the women that were on crack that were white were the wives of Wall Street guys who would bring them home cocaine, powder cocaine, and they were giving birth to babies in the suburbs about uh, that were crack addicted little babies. Um, and so it was easy for the media just to run to the closest ghetto neighborhood near the TV station and get the pictures that they wanted. But you had to really hunt and search to find and to make sure that people realized it was not just a black problem. I tried in my job to dispel negative stereotypes. Of course, this was before President Obama was elected. But if you look on the internet, you will see some of the depictions of him. And I have a white friend, close white friend, who lives in Richmond, Virginia. And I have him send me all the negative stuff that he gets on the internet. Yeah, every day he's getting stuff from friends of his. And I don't know if you saw one of these, but it was a picture of the 44 presidents of the United States. And you saw George Washington and all of them in their official photographs. And you get to the 44th president 
and the picture is just black with two white eyes in it. That was our 44th president of the United States. At Christmas time, there was an Obama ornament, and the ad said, now you can again hang a black man on a tree. Yes, that's how it was being sold. Um, you know, it is important for us to be at the table, for all of us to be at the table. Um, and I'm talking about the news table, the news rim, where the editors and producers and assignment people decide what is going to be the news and who's going to go out and get it. There needs to be someone there who says, wait a minute. Now, is that right? Are we going to do a story this way? Which is something, I was such a thorn in the side of ABC. They just, here she goes again. Oh, and I'm the bad person because I point out things. But we did a story on prime time about grandmothers who are having to rear their daughter's children because the daughters are in prison or are on drugs. They went to Newark, New Jersey, and they profiled in one hour four black grandmothers. So if you looked at that for an hour, you would think that only black grandmothers had daughters who were in prison or addicted to drugs. And I called them up and said, you've got to be kidding. You couldn't, who allowed that to go on the air? Didn't anybody watching that say, hmm, those are only black people that we're showing with this problem. So we have to be at the table. Um, and now those tables have more women seated around them, and I'm glad for that. We did when uh, Viagra came out, <laughs> and I was working for World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Every night for five nights, we had a story on Viagra, and it was like, how much is there to tell about Viagra? <laughs> but it was middle class, upper middle class, middle-aged white men fascinated with that. When tamoxifen came out, we women were like, okay, this, this is considered, you know, something that may positively help women with breast cancer. Do you know we had to fight to get that story on? Because we're not there. We're not there to be able to make out those points. I know I'm going over my time. I'm sorry. Just got to tell you all these things. <laughs> The future does not look particularly bright for minorities, given the economics of media today. The business, and yes, it is a business. I'd like to think of it as a public service that we are providing the American people to have an informed elect electorate to function in a democratic society. I'd like to think that we aren't a business, but we're treated like a business, and it is in flux and there will have to be a shakeout period. I teach at Emerson College here in Boston where we have almost completely scrapped our journalism curriculum to prepare our students for the realities of tomorrow. No longer will they concentrate on print or broadcast. They, every student will be a multimedia journalist. They will have to know how to shoot video. They will have to know how to edit it. They will know how to produce stories. They will be able to broadcast them. Uh, they're going to be able to do everything, shoot still photographs, because no one knows what the future is going to be. We don't know whether there are going to be newspapers left. I think the network evening newscasts are on their way out, and I think that's why Katie Couric is leaving uh, CBS and why you're seeing Meredith Vieira and Matt Lauer talking about going. Things are, because they don't want to pay them that big money anymore. They don't have the big money to pay them. Um, so we are trying to prepare students that will walk out of Emerson College and be able to go into any place 
and be able to work. But the problem is Emerson College costs $45,000 a year for tuition, room, and board. And we are having difficulty getting minorities who are able to pay that kind of money. One more point I want to make, and I'll stop. It's been interesting that the cable news networks have been doing shows on black people. CNN did a two-parter on the black experience and repeated it, and it wasn't the best. Um, MSNBC is this weekend doing the black agenda. Uh, Ed Schultz and uh, Reverend Al Sharpton are together co-hosting that. I'll have to see how that turns out. Um, just taking up the topic doesn't necessarily <laughs> solve some of the problems of distortion. CNN did a black documentary, but it still has no minorities doing programs in prime time where there were recent opportunities to fill jobs with one. A disgraced public figure like Elliot Spitzer can get a job, can do a primetime show, but yet there aren't any black people out there. Uh, it's sad, okay? It's sad. And I just wanna finish with what have we learned about our struggle? That racism is still alive and well. Thank you, Ms. Simpson. Uh, before we go on to Juan, again, we're taking questions. Uh, uh, raise your hands, the, uh, 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 the room monitors, they have index cards to fill out. Uh, we're gonna, uh, to write your questions down, we'll take them and we'll ask them after the panelists have spoken. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, do you wanna grab a mic here or do you wanna stand at the podium? Um, I'll do it from here. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, most of you know me from the, the folks who go regularly to uh, uh, to these conferences or uh, know me as a co-host at Democracy Now! and I've been at Democracy Now! since the show began uh, with Amy Goodman uh, back in um, 1996, I think it was. Yes, it's been about 15 years. Uh, but I've, uh, while I treasure my work with Democracy Now!, I think it is one of the most if not the most important uh, news show uh, in, in America today. Uh, I've had a long career in the corporate or commercial media. Uh, this is my 33rd year as a working journalist in commercial media. Uh, and so I've been able to work in both the alternative media uh, and the commercial media now for quite a while, while also being directly involved in the efforts within the industry or within the profession to uh, change the profession. Uh, I've always been active in the unions of journalists, uh, the Newspaper Guild, and, uh, and been actively involved in rank and file groups and various strikes that have occurred at publications I've worked in. I've been also involved in the professional associations of minority journalists. As, as Joe said, I was the president, I was one of the founders of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists in 1984 and served as its national president. Um, but throughout all these years working in the media, I have been enormously frustrated by the inability of our media system to provide the American people the kind of education and information that they need. The same frustration that brings all of you to conferences like this, uh, that gets so many journalists, uh, Carol, uh, others, uh, daily asking themselves, what are we doing? Uh, what is our role as journalists in this society? So about six or seven years ago, knowing that there were all of these well-meaning people within the industry, uh, and, uh, and also in the alternative uh, press and in those who are activists for media reform seeking to change the system and having so little success, I said to myself, we don't understand the problem as intelligent as we all are, as, as, as dedicated as we all are, as well-meaning as many of the people are, we haven't yet figured out really how our media system works and um, the, we haven't drawn the right lessons from those who have been involved in struggles for media reform 
uh, before us. So I set about re-educating myself about the structure and evolution of the American media system. And the result is, as Joe said, this book that it, we're going uh, to come out in September. Uh, and I think the, the main, I want to share with you some of the main lessons that we did. And we went back into uh, all of the old uh, newspapers, the National Archives, presidential libraries, trying to ascertain what has happened to get our media system to where it is today. And there are several key lessons uh, that I think we learned in the process of the six or seven years of working on this book. Uh, first of all, there's never been a free market in the American media system. Uh, in fact, our entire media system at one point or another has been subsidized and the research for its development and the technologies of mass communications have been subsidized by the American people. At each stage, it was only when a particular technology became, showed potential for profit, that the private sector moved in to demand that the market uh, operate. It begins from the, and McChesney and Richard John and others have already documented the important role of the postal system in the development of newspapers in America today. Uh, the postal system through the second class uh, uh, postage uh, that was decided on by the founders uh, for the dissemination, the widest possible dissemination of knowledge, assured that anybody who wanted to print a newspaper, the federal government would deliver it into the hands of the American people at subsidized rates. And so the American people had more newspapers per person than any people in the history of the world because there was a government policy that decided that the dissemination of knowledge to the people was important for an informed citizenry. And it was made by the founders of this country. Uh, then it went on to the telegraph, where the Congress subsidized Samuel Morse's development of the first telegraph line. Uh, and then only after the, t the telegraph was shown to be a means of uh, speeding up the dissemination of knowledge that the private sector moved in to take over uh, the telegraph. It moved on to the development of radio, where a lot of the early research in radio was done during World War I by the United States Navy. Uh, and then the, as, as soon as the war was over, the Navy sponsored the creation of the Radio Corporation of America, RCA, on which the U.S. Navy had a member on the board of directors of RCA. RCA then spawned NBC. NBC, when it was split up by the Supreme Court, spawned off ABC. And so the federal government was directly involved in the subsidizing of the research and then in sponsoring the development of the radio trust in America. It went on to the, uh, the development of the government sponsoring of NASA and the, all of the developments in travel to the, put up all those satellites into space uh, that so much of the media system now depends upon. Uh, and then, of course, it went to the development of the Internet where the National Science Foundation basically bankrolled all of the early uh, research that was done by universities to develop and create the internet and the infrastructure of the internet. Every one of these communications technologies were subsidized by the American people. And as a result, there was never a free market. The government helped to sponsor it. So that's the first point that we must understand, that the government and the American people have played crucial roles in the development of our mass communications technologies. The second thing that's important to understand is that technology itself is a revolutionary force. Every time a new communications technology has developed, it has destabilized the existing order. And when the existing order gets destabilized, the owners of the old order then run to Congress to develop new rules of operation to deal with the new technology. So it happened with, with um, the telegraph, big battles over whether the telegraph was going to be like the post office and be publicly owned. Uh, it happened with radio. It happened with, uh, uh, then with cable television. And cable is an important, important uh, technology to see how it developed because cable developed as a municipal 
basically as local franchises. Juan, can you hold up your mic? Hold up your mic. Take it out. Hold up your mic a little closer to you. Okay. So cable developed as local franchises, and as a result of that, uh, local governments had to authorize monopoly franchises in different communities. Since most of the local governments in the big cities were minority, uh, were, had lots of minority elected officials, the early days of cable allowed enormous diversification of ownership, diversification of programming, and you had a flowering for a period in cable of some real democratic possibilities, public access channels and so forth. Gradually, as the big companies, Time Warner and Comcast, bought up all the little systems uh, and bought off all the politicians, the promise of cable, the democratic diversification of cable uh, became eroded uh, and and cable became part of the continuing sort of domination of big media. So at every stage, the technology has been revolutionary, has upset the existing order, but then there have been a cries of the business community to put in new rules. And those are what Paul Starr calls uh, the constitutive moments in American media history, or what, or what McChesney calls uh, the, uh, the critical junctures. And in those critical junctures, there's a battle between those who want essentially a centralized system of media in America and those who want a locally based autonomous and decentralized system in America. That is a fundamental battle that we are waging in media reform. Are we going to have a centralized system of mass communication or information where a few companies at the top control are the gatekeepers to that system, whether it's TV, radio, print, internet, it's all the same things. Are we going to have a centralized way of communicating information and use to the American people, or are we going to have a decentralized system? Uh, and one of the theories that we have come up with as we've studied this carefully is that it's only in the periods of the decentralized autonomous systems that African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, minorities, and other uh, 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 minority or dissident groups within the society have an opportunity to be heard. So it is in the interest of all who want a more democratic system to insist on a decentralized and autonomous system of mass communications and information. So that is the sort of the overall framework of understanding that we've come to develop in terms of what, how our system got to be where it is today. How does this all affect the topic of the conversation, which is uh, what's happening with race in America. Well, the other big thing I want to leave you with is that race has been central to the development of the American media system. Uh, unfortunately, even at conferences like this, and I've been coming to these conferences since they started, since before Free Press started, when Don Hazen was organizing the alternate conferences back in the early 1990s. So I've been coming to these conferences for uh, 20 years, off and on. The way these conferences deal with racism and uh, minority issues is as a marginal issue. It's not a central issue to the topic of these conversations. Uh, it's, uh, it's like there's all of these discussions about reforming the structure of the media, and then there's all of these, you know, we got to have some, con some sections here to deal with race and this and that. There's a, a fundamental lack of understanding that race has been at the center of the development of the content of the American media system. Why do I say that? We are in Boston. The first two papers in the history of the United States were right here. Public Occurrences, Benjamin Rush, 1690, of the Boston Newsletter, 1708, John Campbell. Those were the first two newspapers uh, in colonial America. Public Occurrences was a small sheet had three pages, only lasted for one issue because the governing council of Massachusetts immediately shut it down because it was a little bit too rebellious. But I urge you to search on the internet, download, you can find the copies of public occurrences and read the first paper. Read the first paper in America. You will find in that paper five separate items, all dealing with the threat of the Native Americans. Uh, there were threats about Indians lurking around Chelmsford. There were articles about the, the, uh, Ir the Iroquois savages that were allying with the French against the British colonialists. 
the main subject of that first newspaper was intelligence to the settler community about the Native Americans. Read John Campbell's Boston newsletter. Uh, you will find that that newsletter and, and most of the other newspapers that developed uh, in the early colonial periods, another big subject of discussion was slave rebellions, uh, individual violence by slaves against their masters. Uh, one study, David Copeland did a study of, um, of, of uh, early colonial newspapers in the 1700s, found that up to 30% of the total news whole of those newspapers was dedicated to keeping up intelligence on the Native Americans. Right? So that the early press, while it had no involvement of African Americans and Native Americans, one of its central roles was protecting, keeping information flowing among the settlers about the, quote, rebellious uh, slaves and the skulking Indians that the settlers were confronting. So from the very beginning, the press played a key role in terms of determining not only its own understanding of how the settler society was going to deal uh, with the non-white populations, but also justifying to themselves the spread of the republic, <laughs> you know, from the, from the colonies to the, to, uh, then to the republic and then across to the empire. Uh, see, because that, that's the other problem about our press, our press, because we are a settler state, every time the settlers spread westward and created new uh, uh, territories to turn into states. They needed their own local press uh, to keep, because the settlers were spread out over long distances. Uh, the press played a, a very important role in keeping the country together. It was so big. So I think that, that uh, once you understand that historic role of race in, the, in American news coverage, uh, and then of course, once you got into the uh, conquest of the Mexican territories, it became an even bigger problem. You know, People talk all the time about the ethnic press and, and uh, as if it's some like minor part of American journalism. There were 25 Spanish language newspapers in the city of New Orleans before the Civil War. Wow. 25 Spanish language newspapers in one city, New Orleans, before the Civil War, including the first Spanish language daily, Patria. Uh, which started publication in 1846. Uh, there were over a hundred Spanish language newspapers in the Mexican, in the old Mexican territories, Texas, New Mexico, California, uh, and, uh, and, um, and the Louisiana territory before the Civil War. Uh, the uh, uh, Elias Boudinot started the first uh, Native American newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, in 1828. The Cherokee had only developed their written language a few years earlier and then uh, educated the entire nation to read and write uh, the Cherokee language. And within six years of the development of the language, they had their own newspaper, which was repressed and forced out of existence by the settlers, the white settlers of Georgia that w who wanted the Cherokee land. Uh, there's a long history of a dissident press in America. But it's my position that the progressive nature of the dissident press in America ended in the Jacksonian period. From the Jacksonian period on, the commercial press in the United States' main role was to keep the workers of America under control. And the dissident press of America became the uh, African American, Latino, uh, Native American and, and even the Chinese press, which was still pushing forward the idea of democracy and inclusion for all, because unfortunately, many of the working class presses of the period which developed in the 1830s and then turned into the penny press, the commercial press, began to defend the expansion of the empire. So that among the white population, even those who were, quote, progressive, <laughs> the the working man's press were defending the expansion of the empire westward, of the territorial expansion westward. Uh, so that the American commercial press passed from being a dissident press to being a press that defended the status quo. The only ones that continued to insist on greater democracy was the press of people of color. And that continued into the 20th century. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, McChesney talks a lot and it was, he's done great work on the radio battles of the reformers in the early 1920s. But no one talks about the battles at the Pittsburgh Courier 
uh, and the Chicago Defender waged against, uh, against racism in the 20s and 30s. Uh, in, in, 19, in the early 1930s, the Pittsburgh Courier organized a campaign against Amos and Andy, uh, the most popular show in America at the time. Uh, was also considered by many African Americans the most offensive show. The Pittsburgh Courier got 700,000 African Americans to send letters to the Federal Radio Commission demanding that Amos and Andy be taken off the air. The FRC didn't even answer. Did not even answer. 700,000 people, there were 7 million African Americans in the nation at the time. That means one out of every 10 African Americans in the country demanded that Amos and Andy be taken off the air. Uh, that was a media reform movement, a mass media reform movement. Uh, and of course, the most important me uh, media reform movement in the history of the United States occurred in the early 1970s. And Carol talked about the, the period of the 60s and, and 70s. Between 1970 and 1973, there were 350 licensed challenges of the, of the licenses of stations organized by African American and Latino community leaders who most of you have never heard of. William Wright, Emma Bowen, Lonnie King in Atlanta, uh, William Wright in DC, Emma Bowen in New York. They organized their communities. They picketed these stations. They challenged their licenses. There were uh, sit-ins in television and radio stations. And that is what forced the entire broadcast industry to begin hiring the first African Americans and Latinos to change the content of their programs, to add some program geared to the, looking at the positive aspects of the black and Latino community. There was a mass movement that shook the entire industry and then led to the, uh, to the Nixon uh, uh, and Re the Reagan reaction, especially the Reagan, when Reagan brought in Fowler as the head of the FCC, uh, that began to, to uh, bring everything back. This was a massive movement. It was media reform linked with civil rights. The problem we have right now is that we have a very strong media reform movement that has, does not, what is not well connected with the powerful civil rights movement that still exists in America. And in fact, that the civil rights national organizations have been bought off by the telecom companies and by the cable companies. Uh, and, but the, the reform movement has not built the ties with the largest growing sector of the population so that you, you, when you unite the civil rights movement with the media reform movement so that they're not isolated from each other as happened in the 1970s, then you have a powerful movement. Until then, the movements will operate uh, with the, uh, the civil rights community lamenting the fact that the media is constantly portraying them badly but not having the force to be able to affect the change, and the media reform movement uh, saying, hey, well, maybe we'll be able to get the right people elected, uh, and we'll get the right people on the FCC, and they'll listen to us, and we'll show them how smart we are, and how much we understand all the new technology, and they'll come over to our side. No, it doesn't happen that way in Washington. The only way it happens that way in Washington is when you have a force organized out there uh, in all the different communities that goes after these media companies and that goes after the telecom companies and the Googles and, the, uh, and, and, the, and all of the technology companies and forces them to change. So this is what the problem is right now. We have two very, very good movements, but they're traveling on separate paths and they're almost living in separate worlds. Uh, it's almost like they're in separate worlds. And until we bring them together, uh, we're not going to be able, I believe, to affect the kind of media reform that will affect fundamental change in the development of our media system. Once again, we're, gonna, we're taking questions. Please, uh, the monitors are going around with index cards. Fill them out. We'll ask questions. Next uh, presentation is Loris Taylor from Native Public Media. Uh, we're going we're gonna to lower the lights. Um, so you can see a PowerPoint on the screen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, the Native Americans are still skulking, but this time they're <laughs> restless. <laughs> okay, so I come from a land where uh, it's believed that only one, la one language should be uh, primary, 
and where ethnic studies and history and culture should be eliminated, and where if you're brown, you could be uh, questioned and or arrested. So um, great state of Arizona. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about native public media and media reform uh, from the Native American, uh, through the Native American lens. And I'll have to say that I'm probably a newbie uh, to uh, media. Uh, my background primarily comes from land, water, and energy. And so I was really in tune with water rights, land rights, that sort of thing. I just carried that mentality over to media. Now, when I started with Native Public Media, that was back in 2004, I quickly found that there were uh, broadcasting facilities out in Indian country that were uh, you know, perhaps knew about what each other's work, but were not connected. And so um, part of Native public media's mission was to bring that family uh, into the same circle. And basically, here's my belief. Um, I strongly believe in media ownership, access, and control. And if you, if you take anything away from my presentation, that's basically my strategy. Uh, I simply got tired about, of, of writing a thousand press releases that I knew were not ever going to get published in mainstream media, uh, no matter how hard I tried. And I also strongly believe that the self-determination of tribes is extremely important and that Indian nations that exist today are still inherently sovereign. So, so part, part of the policy work that we do today is based on that, on that principle. So basically, if you look at the mission of, of Native public media, where our work is primarily to build healthy, engaged, and independent Nat Native American communities using technology and media to do this. So it's, a, it's not so much that the technology and media is central, but, but that they're integral uh, to healthy communities. Um, so, so part of our core competence is just a little bit about native public media before I start ranting on about the media reform. Uh, we basically have four major uh, focus uh, from, the, uh, from the organization. We're focused on leadership and policy. We're focused on the digital ecology of Native America. We're, we're focused on the sustainability of, of media and what that means for us in the future. And we're definitely focused on service to the network that we've been able to build. And believe it or not, that that's a picture of me from um, a much younger time. So I'm going to move on quickly to the next slide. Uh, so a little bit about invisibility. Now, if we had investigative reporters like a while back, perhaps we would have uh, reported on the first recorded zero that was discovered from a Maya carving. Uh, perhaps we would have known that at one time there were nearly 25 million Native Americans that inhabited North America. Has every, anybody ever wondered where they've all gone? and ever reported on where they might be. Um, perhaps we would have learned that 95% of people, the native people died from disease during the first 130 years of contact. Has anybody reported on that? Perhaps we would have learned that some of our agricultural products that are thriving in today's market including corn and squash and melons and chili and all kinds of other good stuff, came from Native Americans. And perhaps we would have reported that the development of corn is probably by far one of the most beautiful and profound genetic engineering ever on this earth. And perhaps we would have learned that at one time, there were about 180 language families in the Americas, and 62 of those were in North America. Imagine that, what we could have done with all the reporters in those early years. Now here's something to remember. History belongs to the person with the pen. 
And so we've learned over time that in our history books, there's very little mention of Native Americans. And perhaps in your schools, it was maybe a paragraph, and if not that, maybe a sidebar. So, so we should be asking ourselves, whose history is it? Whose great books are we reading? Whose stories are helping to carve our place in today's world? Well, you know, that was way back when, but what about today? You know, unfortunately, we're still suffering from modern day invisibility. A few years back, a study came out, and it basically said that most Americans believed that somewhere in the 1800s, Native Americans became extinct. I mean, believe, I mean this is like a 2009 report. The other thing it said was Native Americans are all the same, um, which is not true, of course. There was also little knowledge of Indian federal policies. How many of you studied Indian federal policy in high school or in college? Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Very few people know that the U.S. Constitution mentions Native Americans specifically. And when I was watching C-SPAN, when con the Congress was reading out the U.S. Constitution, I think they were amazed because they were saying, like, every budget spending we have has to be constitutional, you know? And prior to that reading, there was a lot of discussion about, like, well, we've got to cut funding to Indian nations because it's not constitutional. You know, so I'm watching C-SPAN, and they got to those parts, you know, and it said, you know, we shall deal with Indian nations, you know. So anyway, it was the highlight of my day. I normally don't watch C-SPAN that long, but I was like, I'm going to watch this. Did you know that also the U.S. Constitution is modeled after the Iroquois Confederacy Constitution? Now, most people perhaps know that part, which is, re which is really a highlight, I think, in Indian America, but it's not highlighted for the rest of America. Now here, here's a little known fact, and, and this is where I think media and reporting is so important. Native Americans' right to vote. Do you know when that occurred? Do you have any idea? Well, you know, here's the deal. They give you the right to vote, right? 1870? But then they didn't pass the Indian Citizenship Act until 1924. But, in, but even though we were granted the right to vote in 1870, a lot of states prevented and prohibited Native Americans from voting all the way up until 1948, and it continued into the 60s until tribes went to court to, to, to really secure their right to vote. And it wasn't until 1965 that the Voting Rights Act was um, uh, passed for Native Americans. And that's just like yesterday, right? So imagine that. There were many, uh, many Native Americans who were serving in the military, but they didn't have the right to vote. They, were, they weren't allowed to vote, I should say. So, so um, all this stuff has really forged the way I look at media reform. Because you're not just fighting for your voice on the air, whether it's radio or television. You're really fighting for intellectual capacity and diversity in this country. When I'm in Arizona and people are telling me it's an English-only state, and I'm thinking, well, there's 22 tribes here, by the way. Has anybody noticed? You know, they're all speaking their languages, and so now they're all involved in Ill illegal activity. You know, so in Arizona, they also have a law that prevents ethnic studies. I don't know if you've heard about this. You know, you can't teach culture. Why? Because you might use it to overthrow the government. And again, there's 22 tribes. We have history, we have culture, we have language. So I'm thinking like, well, I wonder if they're gonna come and round us up one day and haul us off. 
And I think, I think it's a very insidious way of telling a group of people, whether it's by race or the color of your, screen, of your skin, that you are not a part of civil society, that you are not able to contribute to the intellectual capacity of this great nation of ours, and that moreover, you should not be allowed to participate in the democracy of this country. And those are the messages that are being passed on uh, to our young people. So here's a snapshot of Native America. Uh, we have a collective land base today of over, of nearly 60 million acres in the United States. We have non-federally recognized natives, which includes the Hawaiians and the Halma and other tribes, which, which simply means that the federal government doesn't uh, believe that these are nations anymore, that they've ceased to exist. Uh, there are about 5.2 million American Indians and Alaska Natives according to the 2010 census, and that perhaps is going to be larger. And then, of course, there's some other stuff. The poverty level is still pretty high. A quarter are, are, um, are not in good shape. But I think what's important to understand is that if you remember that there were close to 25 million at one time, this is a very low number. And I think, I think part of the um, ingrained historical racism is not to tell that story. Because it's quite easy to say that we inhabited these lands because there was nobody here, right? So let's just discount all those millions of people um, they've, they've just simply evaporated into the air, and it's part of uh, the history of this country not to tell that story. So here's what the map looks like today. This is what's left of tribal homelands, and, it, and it, you can see that it's very spotty, and if you look at the eastern seaboard, uh, you know, you can see westward expansionism, and that's part of our American history. And, and, whether, and whether we like it or not, this, this is part of the history that we all share. So, state of media in Indian country. Um, well, sad to say, uh, there's really no data on native media. No one collects it. And in fact, on my first free press conference, um, there were, I went to one session where they talked about African-American media folks, they talked about the Latinos, they mentioned the Asians, and then they stopped. You know, and there was no mention of Native Americans. And I said, hello, um, is anyone collecting this data? You know? Um, so anyway, this next part is an eye test. I just wanted to throw it in. <laughs> but but I, was, I was trying to capture like newspapers in Indian country and Juan was really nice enough to mention the Cherokee Phoenix. The 1800s were a very volatile period for Native Americans. Th this was the time when Native Americans decided to stand up for their rights on land and other issues and the, really the, the paper grew out of uh, court cases. I mean, th th this was during the Marshall Trilogy. If you look at American Indian law, this really was the time when there was a lot of things happening. It really started around the 70s, but even before the 70s, we had a few natives that were starting shows on the air. And uh, today, we have uh, 42 native public radio stations on the air, and we're now in about 16 states. So we're growing. Uh, but the need is still great. We have 565 Native nations in this country, and we have a long ways to go. Uh, we also operate our own satellite distribution highway called Native Voice One. Uh, we carry program, programming and content to all the 42 uh, Native stations, and we also have 200 non-Native affiliates who are interested in Native programming. In terms of uh, television, here's where we're making tiny, tiny inroads. It's, it's not enough. Uh, the first native reporter on television was a woman by the name of Tana Beebe. 
And of course, Hattie Kaufman, who unfortunately was laid off recently by a major network on the West Coast. Oh, you didn't know that. I hate. Yes, she she was laid off. The one of the um, um, uh, one of the what would you say victims of the economic recession. Uh, and so it seemed like we make uh, two steps forwards and perhaps three uh, back. In terms of web-based media, that's growing. And this is, this is just a snapshot. Uh, there are many more natives who are now migrating uh, onto the internet. So we, do, we really do have some digital natives out there uh, that are, are now entering the market. I just love that uh, title, the digital natives, wow. Where did they come from? Uh, so, so here's kind of a summary. Uh, 42 native stations on the air, as I mentioned, a little over close to uh, 250 newspapers still in circulation. So what, are, so what are the issues that are facing the native media industry? Well, it's the same thing that's facing the African Americans, the same stuff that's facing the Latinos, it's really barriers. Uh, some of our, our nations are in some of the most remote and rural places in America. It's policy that does not favor Native Americans. It's the changing landscape. It's capacity. It's racism. And you know what really gets me? It's the indifference that I feel sometimes, where people simply don't care whether Native Americans have a voice or not. And that, by far, I think is something uh, that we need to work to overcome. And so I'm happy to answer questions at the end of our panel Great. discussion. So, um, we are, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, we're going to try to run over a little bit on time, guys, so we can get a couple of questions. We're running out of time here. So Rinku, why don't we throw it to you, then we'll get to questions right away. Um, I think I'm going to be quick. I hope so. So I actually want to lift up a point that Joe and Juan uh, made in a paper that they wrote called uh, How Long Must We Wait, which was about, it was a precursor to your book, right? It's something I learned a lot from. So in, the, in that paper, one of the points they made was that uh, reporters of color, journal journalists of color, have to reach out in a different way to our white colleagues, to white reporters and editors, um, in a different way than the way that we have been. Because in this climate, all of us are really vulnerable to being laid off and to having our jobs consolidated and to losing uh, whatever access we have to, to the media. And so we're in a, in a situation where everybody's hurting and where uh, white reporters, white colleagues, experience our uh, talk about diversity as a threat. And they hunker down, they, they build a fort around themselves, and they try to prevent us from getting their jobs. And whatever good intentions there are in the media, that kind of division just really undermines that. And, um, and I think the, the question really is who's, who's actually responsible for the kinds of situations that we're in and for the kinds of um, uh, shutout of communities of color that have uh, been true in the mainstream media in particular. And I'm going to suggest that one of the ways in which we can uh, create a situation in which all reporters, or as many reporters as possible, as many media workers as possible, are attached to the goal of creating racial equity and racial justice, attached to the goal of closing the racial gap, both in the media, but also in the world, in our country, in the world, ending segregation, uh, bringing people together, uh, not just in their minds, but in the conditions, the actual conditions of their lives, that one of the big challenges is to actually redefine racism. So in our country today, the way that people define racism is the same way as it was defined uh, 40, 50, 100 years ago. And that is as a phenomena that is always individual, always intentional, and always obvious. So if there is no noose hanging, then people will say there is no racism here. There is no discrimination here. And of course, we know as reporters and as consumers of, of good reporting, of good journalism, that quite often, particularly 
today when we have civil rights laws that have made illegal that kind of blatant and obvious racism, we know that yet the racial gap continues to grow and continues to be as strong as it ever was. So if you have outlawed intentional racism, then how can that be? How can you still have this huge gap? And I think that that is because the rules of institutions and of our structures, the system has not actually changed um, in many, many ways. And when you have color blindness, a concept that makes a lot of intuitive sense. If you, if racial discrimination causes all these problems, you should be able to get rid of it by encouraging people simply not to see race. If color blindness is laid on top of a history of explicit exclusion, that's when you get a racial gap continuing to grow. And so what we've got in many of our newsrooms and in many of our organizations, and I think Juan alluded to this in the media reform movement as well, is uh, is really the rule of color blindness as the solution to racial discrimination. What we need actually is a systemic consciousness, a consciousness about how the rules of our society and of our media institutions continue to keep the racial gap in place. Uh, those rules, when they are written down, they're called policies. And when they're not written down, they're called practices. They're the things that happen again and again and again. It's a thing that makes it so that when the AP runs two photos of people uh, escaping and trying to survive d during Hurricane Katrina, the photo with the white people is called to survive, you know, is labeled survivors, and the photo with the black people is labeled looters. That's, there's no rule in the AP that says you've got black people in a picture Sure, you got to call them the worst thing you can think of to call them. Um, nevertheless, that is what happens again and again and again. So, uh, one of the things that we have tried to do at the Applied Research Center and at Color Lines uh, to close the racial gap and to create common ground among all the people who want to take apart the racial hierarchy, all the well intentioned people, is to focus on the impact of our reporting, of our systems, of our rules, rather than focus on the intention. So this can be a really difficult thing because, in fact, there are lots of intentionally racist people out there. Uh, they're spitting on John Lewis during uh, the healthcare reform debate. They are raising questions about Barack Obama's uh, birth certificate. And I'm not going to argue that there isn't some intention there to keep people of color down. But I believe that most of the harm that is created in our country today still, the things that still keep the racial gap in place, much of that is actually perpetuated by people who have good intentions, who if you ask them, do you think that black people deserve to be represented in these stereotypic ways, would say, no, I don't think so. Do you think that uh, uh, Native Americans are always skulking and alcoholic and uh, gamblers? They would say, no, I don't believe that about Native Americans. Uh, but nevertheless, they again and again and again participate in institutions that uh, keep, those, keep those gaps in place. I'm going to tell you a very quick story about an organization that we work with in Minnesota, a very white state, uh, just starting to change in its demographics, the Organizing Apprenticeship Project. It has fans. Um, OAP, the Organizing Apprenticeship Project, is uh, an organization that trains people uh, to do organizing and to make progressive change, and also has a number of direct political projects. One of the things they do is a racial equity report card on the state legislature every year. So each year, they have a set of criteria, five things that make for racial equity, and if you don't have them, you're not going to have racial equity. And they apply those five criteria to all of the bills that have gone through the state ledge that year. And then they grade each of the legislators and the governor on their performance in relation to those bills. So some people get A's and some people get C's and some, people's get, some people get F's. And some of the people who get A's are Republicans and some of the people who get C's and D's are, end up being Democrats um, and sometimes of color. Now, when OAP did their first report card of this nature to, to have the state really look at where are our rules getting us in relation to the racial gaps in our state, the, the record, the newspaper of record, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, actually 
wrote a story, the reporter reported on, the, on their report and wrote the story, but the story never ran. So when the organization called the editor and said, why didn't our story run, the editor said to them, we, we are also concerned about racial gaps and uh, racial disparities, but we have our own thinking about what causes them and racism isn't among those causes. It's not racism that causes racial disparities, he said, it's other things, some set of other things. And so over the next two years, OAP identified a person, a person in their circle, who had uh, sub-relationships with the editorial board of that newspaper and with the editor, and they prepared that person over the course of two years to be able to talk about how you could have legislation that created and expanded racial gaps, even if there was no way to pin down intentional racism among any of those legislators even in the absence of intention, how you could still produce racial gaps. And the goal, of course, is to get rid of those racial disparities. Any society that has huge racial disparities uh, is going to suffer as a whole eventually. Uh, we have plenty of examples of that uh, in our national politics now. And so uh, when they did their third report, this they activated their ally. They began to talk and talk and talk with that editorial board. They had a set of meetings. And by the time their next report came out, they got not just a story about their report, but an editorial saying, this kind of racial impact analysis of legislation is the best thing since sliced bread, and it should happen at every level of government in the state. Every school board, every city council, and definitely the state legislature should do this before they actually adopt a new piece of policy. Now, does that Minnesota state legislature have people in it who are racist people? I am sure that it does. Oh, yeah. I'm positive that it does, and so is this brother right here. Um, <laughs> and, and, and this sister right here. Um, but by changing the frame on this story um, from who is a racist to what is causing racial inequity, uh, OAP was able to get a number of people who had not been allies to this cause to join it. And I think that is because intention is impossible to determine. I don't know what is in the heart of every single politician in this country. I really can't say. I don't know who's got a black wife. I don't know who has a Latina nanny uh, who they you know, entrust their kids to. I just don't know what they're thinking. But I do know that certain actions either grow the racial gap or close the racial gap. And it's those actions and their impact on which we have to focus. I believe that if we begin to be good at doing that, then we can drive the conversation about race in the media and in the country um, beyond a diversity conversation, which is satisfied by simply having uh, faces of color in the room, to an equity conver conversation in which uh, people of color can actually influence the agenda that gets discussed in that room. Uh, in this room, as well as in the newsrooms that we're all attached to, uh, as well as in the halls of government. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. All right. So let's go through some questions real quick. Juan, why don't we, you and I answer the first question because it's directed toward us and I don't want to uh, duck a question toward us. That's, that's, that's maybe critical. Um, the media reform now, I think the media reform movement now mirrors the mainstream free press and democracy now. Now still don't cover issues on race. Tell me why I should believe differently. Uh, so why don't you go first? We'll tackle that real quick and then we'll go to the next question. Could you repeat that again? That the free press and democracy now still don't cover issues on race. Tell me why I should believe differently. That, that the main media reform movement now mirrors the mainstream free press and democracy now. So we don't cover issues on race. Tell me why I should think differently. Uh, well, I, I would. The microphone. Uh, I would dif disagree that they don't that they cover. Uh, you saying free press and democracy so now? now. Yeah, you put us both in there. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I would I would disagree that. Um, uh, first of all, obviously, um, free press does not cover the news as much as it deals with uh, how to reform. Uh, the new system, but I, I would say that democracy now, and, and I'm the first to admit that democracy now has many failings, but I think that of many of the media companies uh, uh, that are out there, the media operations that are out there, uh, that uh, democracy now uh, has made a, a conscious and clear effort in terms of not only 
uh, providing a coverage of, of marginalized communities in this country, but around the world, uh, in a way that re really is uh, unmatched by most of the media organizations, even within the progressive movement. Uh, I think that um, that uh, the and the level of of uh, of diversity of the new staffs of Democracy Now. I don't know how many of you have actually seen, is, is really uh, is stellar in many ways. It still needs a lot of progress, absolutely. Uh, but I think that, um, that uh, Democracy Now! has done a real good job in terms of, of t dealing with the stories and within the African American community, the Latino, the, uh, the uh, Native American communities, as well as internationally. Uh, and in terms of free press, I think that free press has done a remarkable job as an organization in raising media reform to much higher levels. Uh, but I do express uh, frustration uh, after coming to these conferences for many, many years uh, that they're the, the, and it's, they're, they're getting more, they're getting better, but that there needs to be a real attempt to address in a central way the changing nature of the American population and who are the people who are most likely to press forward media reform over the next 10, 20 years in the country. I'll just add to that that I, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, we're improving. I mean, there's a long way to go. I see folks who've been very critical of us in, in the audience. Um, but I think also, two years, folks in the audience who we have a much better relationship with today as opposed to two, three years ago, which is a sign of progress. It's not something you can see on the outside. Uh, but uh, we are partnering with folks because, obviously, that's, that's the way to build change. And so. Um, I'll leave it at that. So let's get to some journalism questions. Can I add to that? Just Go, really for sure. Quickly. Go for it. And, and Lois is a, is a board member, by the way. I, press, I so. am a new board member to Free Press. I will carry your concerns to the rest of my board colleagues. Yes. So I think we're making progress. Okay. What advice would you give to young aspiring journalists of color work, working within the mainstream to change it or to change it? Should he work within the mainstream to change it or should he change it from the outside through activism? Does working for mainstream media compromise your beliefs and mission for racial equality as a minority journalist, or does it uphold the dominant, um, can't read that one, but dominant structure, basically? Uh, why don't, uh, Ms. Simpson, why don't you answer that question first? That was a lot. <laughs> uh, what should young people do? Um, first of all, young people entering the industry are so happy to have a job that they don't want to do anything to rock the boat. And I found that I had to speak for them, someone who was mature, who has was secure in her position, that I would have to speak for them. But how many places are there people like me now <laughs> that would take up the cause of younger people? Um, so you think it compromises them if they were, if, can you change uh, can you be a person within the newsroom and actually change the culture of the newsroom to actually cover people of color better? Do you think it's not until you yes, not until you've been there a while and established yourself, you know, as as a good journalist? Um, but it's hard for young people to do that. Um, they've they've got to get some uh, miles under their belt before they can do anything. Great, and uh, I'll ask Rinku too. It's, um, you have color lines, love color lines. Um, what would your advice be to that same young journalist? Should he try to work for color lines or should he try to go into the mainstream? You, <laughs> well, I think that um, you should go where you can get a job and uh, I think, and where, you know, if you have the, the great fortune of being well matched to that place, you know, that's, that's a place where you're able to do the kinds of reporting you believe in. Uh, that's even better. But my main advice for young people going into journalism or into any field, really, is to get to be really good at, at that job, but also get to be really good at understanding power and how power works. So I, I went to journalism school at Columbia, and um, I went after 15 years as a community organizer where I spent all of my time thinking about power, how you unleash the power people have inside them, how it works. And that's what I find many journalists don't have a very good understanding of. And so if you don't understand how power works, then whether you're at Color Lines or you're at ABC News, you're going to have a hard time getting stuff moving that you want to move. Um, so, 
so that would be my advice: is study power and um, and you know learn how to analyze it. And that that's something you can learn from organizers and activists probably better um, than you can um, from your editor. Uh, so expand those mentors so you can get that too. I just I just wanted to add to the point about power. Can you hear me? It doesn't sound like. Yes, you can. Okay. Oh, you do. Very directional, Mike. Um, we um, participated in some sensitivity and diversity training when I was at ABC, and they brought in a black woman that um, consults with major corporations. And she took us as black people, black employees of ABC, and she said, now what do you think, what are the 10 things that you need to succeed in corporate America? And she was talking about the power spectrum. So we all thought you got to have the skills, the qualifications, and so on. The second thing we thought you needed was to excel at them. And she shook her head and she was going, that represents about 10% of what is necessary to succeed in corporate America. All the rest of the crap, who you know, who your daddy is, um, what is perceived as power. I was perceived as powerful because I wasn't afraid to speak up and go to the media, go to the television critics and report about things that were happening at ABC. So they saw me as having power even though I typically didn't have any power. But it's all those other things, your appearance, your sense of humor, um, and 10% and was having the ability and the qualifications and the excellence to do the job. So people have got to learn how do you exercise those other powers that are much more important than just being good at what you do. Great. I want to I get at least two more questions in here. Um, besides supporting public media and media reform, how can we hold our journalists accountable for their betrayals of race and also their inability to hold uh, the public interest over corporate interest. So how do we hold journalists accountable, basically? Uh, any thoughts, Juan, you want to tackle that? Anybody, Juan, you want to tackle that? How do we hold journalists accountable these days? Well, what, Mike? Well, as I said before, I think that, the, the, I mean, in the, in the corporate media, there is a, a growing sort of uh, fatigue on the part of the owners who are all basically trying to figure out how to survive with any thoughts of really improving their coverage uh, or uh, uh, further integrating their new staffs. Uh, and I think that what I have tried to do uh, with, within the, uh, in, in my capacity within the, the commercial or corporate media is organize my fellow journalists. Uh, because, you know, the vast majority of journalists, whether they're in the alt alternative media or in the commercial media, they all come into the business with this, or the profession with this, these ideals of things that they wanted to do to be able to change the world. And then as Carol says, when they're young at first, they're worried about being able to get up their, their stories in and be approved and move up the ladder. So they begin to compromise at the very beginning, you know, being quiet, doing what they're told. Um, and they all feel powerless, you know, because as, as we talked about on Democracy Now! with Wisconsin, um, the most undemocratic place in America is the workplace. <laughs> right? It's the workplace, especially if there is no union. The workplace is a completely authoritarian, dictatorial place. What the boss or the supervisor says is what you do. You do not question. Anybody who questions is automatically seen as a problem. Uh, and uh, so and there are some enlightened owners and managers that deal with it, things a different way. So that what I have always tried to do is build organization, uh, whether there's a union or not, find common ground with my fellow journalists and try to, for us to act together on things. Uh, and uh, that's why I've always been involved in the unions with the professional associations, because then you have, it's not just you. You know, it's you and a group. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into an editor's office with a group <laughs> to complain about a problem. Uh, and uh, or uh, I have written uh, put petitions on the bulletin board about coverage of our own of our own organization, criticizing coverage of the organization, asking people to join 
the petition, showing the younger reporters that it is possible to say respectfully. It's not, you know, uh, I don't have a problem with you. I have a problem with your ideas. Or I have a problem with the way you're managing the coverage. Uh, so that, uh, in other words, to build a sort of collective sense that producing news in any organization is a collective endeavor. And the people at the top should be willing to be to hear people who have differences of view. You're building the democratic culture, <laughs> in essence, uh, within the newsroom. And when you don't have the structures of a union and a contract uh, to be able to give you that basic protection, you just got to be a little bit more um, skilled at how you build that collective uh, action approach uh, within the newsroom. Uh, and I mean, there are some of my fellow African American and Latino journalists have always taken the point of view, oh, no, nah, these, uh, these colleagues are racist, as editors racist, I don't want to deal with them. I said, no, that's not the way. You've got to educate people. You've got to change the culture of the newsroom. You've got to di differentiate between the person and their ideas. Uh, but you've got to be firm that certain things are not acceptable to you because they're not part of your core belief values and that you're not going to just let them pass. So I think that's the key. Uh, to, you know, uh, and I've concentrated on within the media. I mean, folks who are outside uh, have a different role to play because they've got to build the community, uh, the community pressure on these organizations. Uh, and I think that's always valuable, the pressure from outside. But I, I deal with it more from the perspective, how do I organize my fellow media workers to change the industry in which we work? Right. I'm going to take another one more. Might be the last question here, but I want to, for Rinku and, and uh, Loris, 40 years after the current commission report, the mainstream press, in spite of some increases in diversity, continues to promote news from a perspective that marginalizes people of color. Little has changed. Is it not time for people of color to focus more on the creation of our own media? Should we? Bring, uh, so, Loris and, and Rinku. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> media ownership, access, and control are absolutely important. Uh, when I was growing up, around when I was like 10 years old, I used to root for the cowboys. When they were in cowboy and Indian depictions on, on TV, because they always won, you know? So I was like, I, I was, I was, you know, when I was younger, I would tell my parents, I want to grow up to be a cowboy, you know? But, but I learned uh, uh, quickly, uh, but I think the strategy of native public media is ownership. Unless you own your own broadcast facilities, unless you own your own print media, unless you own your own internet platforms and your own television uh, stations and or channels, uh, you're always going to be uh, trying to get on someone else's media. And, and their mission may not be compatible with your mission, which is to provide an authentic voice uh, for in our case, for Native Americans to tell their own stories, to have their own place in history, to talk about their culture, and to and and to say it in their own tribal languages, and so um, at Native Public Media, we're all about ownership because that's the way we get access and that's the way we control our own media destiny. Uh, I really, really agree with that. I do. I am the publisher of an outlet that is owned and operated by people of color. Um, I think the only thing I would add is that there is a relationship between the two, between the media that we own and operate and start um, and the larger ma mainstream and commercial media. I, I dream about the day that colorlines.com can have the audience that CNN does, but we are not at that day. And I want access to an audience that's bigger than the audience I currently have. And so, um, you know, we, we can collaborate with a lot of other independent press outlets to, to uh, grow that audience and to, to get there. But I do think that we have to also be trying to get our stories into the mainstream. There are risks and rewards that go along with that and, um, you know, lots of problems. But, but uh, you know, I'm so grateful that we have a Juan Gonzalez at the Daily News, that we had a Bob Herbert at the New York Times. Um, Used to. <laughs> yes, formerly at the New York Times, because I think we need the eyeballs that they are able to reach that that Color Lines uh, does not yet. 
I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but it's no always problem. something. I have something else to add to. Uh, it may work for Native Americans. It may work with color lines. I look at BET. I had such hope for BET. Black entertainment television. And I, they killed their news department. They are showing these awful videos of gangster rap and stuff like, so, you know, in the hands of <laughs> some very responsible people and caring people, it might make a difference, but I don't think it's just a matter of ownership. Because Bob Johnson, friend of mine, he started BET, but it did not ever live up to what we hoped it would. Well, you know, when he was uh, chosen to run BET by uh, John Malone, John Malone was trying to get into cities to get cable uh, franchises, and he funded Bob Johnson's creation of BET. And the reason he did it, and he said it because he's the right kind of black man who won't cause trouble, basically. He's not, he's not a rebel rouser. And you, you read there's a book on BET that, that profiles Bob Johnson, and it, you, there's a quote from John Malone. So that's the problem when you don't have control of your own image, and they're going to pick someone who is not going to advance our image. So that you know, so it's true. Like Ron, you want to say something? Too? Yeah, I, I wanted to um, say something about this ownership issue because this is something that I've been harping on for uh, years. I do think that the the democratic right to own media companies in America is the right to do bad stuff as well as good stuff, uh, and that uh, while it doesn't necessarily mean that it will guarantee. Uh, the uh, the uh, the the best possible uh, news information or entertainment. The problem that we have in America today is that we are heading toward a de a de facto apartheid media system, where the ownership by people of racial minorities of radio, television, virtually no daily newspapers in America today are owned uh, by people of color. Uh, uh, even the few Spanish language dailies that exist now are no longer owned by Latinos. They're owned by uh, uh, a Canadian uh, a Canadian company uh, with U.S. hedge fund investment. Uh, the uh, uh, so that you're facing the fact that it's about eight percent in radio ownership, three percent in television ownership, uh, and virtually nothing in newspapers. And yet, the minority population of the country is currently about thirty-five percent, and will soon be fifty percent. So you're reaching a situation where within another 20, 30 years, racial minorities will, have, will be the majority of the U.S. population, but will own virtually none of the major media outlets in the country. Uh, and uh, so that is a major problem of democracy uh, that, uh, that has to be addressed. The U.S. government did at a time do that. Uh, in the late 1970s, they created the... the the, the Congress created the tax credit uh, uh, certificate, where basically companies that were seeking to sell some of their uh, radio stations or television stations would get a tax credit from the government if they sold that property to a minority owner. Uh, and that was the only period of major growth of minority ownership in television and radio. Now, there was some abuse of the system because some companies tried to have front minority front people who, to be on paper as the owners of the companies instead of really owning them. But for the most part, they really did open up the, uh, the first uh, uh, significant change in minority ownership in radio and television. The first thing that the Republican Congress did uh, after the 1994 Republican Revolution that came in in 1995 was abolished the tax credit certificate uh, policy. And uh, since then, minority ownership has been in decline throughout the United States. So again, there are federal policies that can be put into place that would change the nature from a centralized system of ownership to a decentralized system, uh, an autonomous system. And it's in, within that decentralized system that you have greater opportunities for more democratic differences and voices to be heard. And remember, that is part of the original Federal Communications Act, right? That, that, the, uh, that, that uh, the public interest has been interpreted by the federal courts to mean localism, diversity, and competition. Diversity of voices. Uh, it's, it is part of federal communications policy that we need a system that has a diversity of voices. And diversity of ownership has been proven to be a factor, a major factor in diversity of voices. So it's only a question of like fulfilling the communications policy of the country and adapti adopting the proper uh, governmental reforms that would make that possible. 
Great. You know, I just I just want to add one little point to that. Then we're going to close up that the idea that you know Bob Johnson was disappointment, right? But the idea that we're not going to have any more African American Supreme Court justices because Clarence Thomas is there. You know, I mean, we need we need to continue to have a critical mass because there's going to be bad owners, but there's going to be other owners who are going to do a better job. And so, uh, but we don't have that in cable. We may have that uh, uh, is declining because of consolidation in radio and uh, in television. So, um, um, like Juan said, uh, you know, minority minority employment in newsrooms is declining. So uh, it's it's really in, we're really in bad shape when it comes to uh, uh, continuing to ensure that we are um, telling our own stories. You know, and have control over over our own own, own image. Uh, thank you guys for hanging in there. Uh, I know we went over. I hope this was good. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you're having a good rest of the conference. Thank you.